history doesn't talk about the Tuskegee Airmen. And if you read American history, you're not going to find out too much about the integration of the armed forces until those history books are rewritten. Ladies and gentlemen, an original member of the Tuskegee Airmen, World War II fighter pilot, maintenance chief, and educator, Lieutenant Colonel Gene Carter. evening we're going to talk about a group of men who saw the need for social change within our country. These were young men with special views who had already formed opinions as to how these needs could be met and what changes could be made to make life better for them. And they met that need by successfully managing the integration of minorities into the armed forces of these United States of America. America's quick fix for this problem, they went to all of the historically black colleges like the University of Alabama, Auburn, etc. And they made a pact with the presidents that if they would allow their students, male or female, 18 years of age or older, who could pass the physical who could pass the written examination, could take flying training at no cost, and they could earn a private pilot's license and a commercial license. And this was wonderful. And in passing that act, President Roosevelt signed it. They forgot. There were six historically black colleges. And this is what broke that trend because it was an act now of Congress that if you went to a historically college, you could take flying training. These six colleges, Delaware State, Howard University, Hampton University, West Virginia State, a and in Greensboro, and Little Old Tuskegee here in Alabama. <laughs> and between 1941 or 41 and 1945, better than 3,000 students volunteered for flying training at these six historically black colleges. came back to Tuskegee September. We thought we'd be in combat by Thanksgiving. We were still in Alabama. Christmas came and passed. We were back in Florida, in the Mabry, Tallahassee. What was the problem? No commander from Burma to England wanted this old black fighter squadron. They said it would create problems that the white enlisted man would not take an order from a black non-commissioned officer. Easter Sunday morning, 1943, we arrived at Casablanca, North Africa. We started our theater orientation and indoctrination and much to our chagrin, we were not pursuit pilots. We were doing what was called close tactical ground support. When you were above 500 feet, you were too high to see those camouflage targets on the ground, fuel dumps, 
ammunition dollars, motor transports on the highways, locomotives on the railways, troops on the grounds, and when you really got sharp, motorcycles and side carts on the highways. But here you are, day in and day out, and the aircraft fired direct, accurate, and very intense. By saying that we're going to have P-47s, we call it the jug, look like an inverted bathtub. <laughs> but uh, it could go 20,000 feet, and it could go nearly 300 miles an hour. At P-40, you couldn't get it that fast with the few jet uh, propel bottles behind it. <laughs> you couldn't get it to 20,000 feet with a jack. It, just, <laughs> it didn't have that capability. But uh, here we are now with that P-47. And our target is to protect that invasion fleet there at Anzio. And between the last week of February and the first two weeks of March, they shot down 18 aircraft over Anzio. No more, no longer could the myth that the black man could not fly and fight be supported. Because they said that the black man was lazy, he was like a day ago, he had neither physiological or psychological qualities for leadership. And they put that to be the myth there over NGO. And what a wonderful day and great news that was. Colonel Davis was very pleased. And we moved on in beyond Rome. And the next good news was we were being taken from the 12th Tactical Air Force. And we were going to be assigned to the 15th Air Force Long Range Bomber Escort. And this was B-24s and B-17s across the Alps, across the Adriatics, into Southern Europe. One day over Munich, the next day over Zurich, the next day over Budapest. The next day, wherever the wee bombers were, the men of the 332nd were there, and we now have four squadrons. We decided that we not only needed to be identified by a symbol, but we also needed a call sign name. And we said the call sign would be red tail, and we painted the tails of all 72 of those P-51s that we got, we painted them red. The war now is winding down. Time to come home. Get back to America. We went over with the hope of a double B being destroyed. We destroyed Hitler and his Nazism, Mussolini and his fascism. But when we got back to America and went down those game planks, the one on the right said colored and the one on the left said white. We had not destroyed that prejudice and discrimination here in America. They all went home to take, take parades and all other honors. We went our individual ways to our various homes on 30 day leaves and reported back to Gottman Field, Kentucky. And a few of us got back and went along before we were surprised with the orders that we we're going to be going to the Pacific on a composite, with a composite group, B-25s and P-47s. And in 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed 
the executive order 9981 that said no more, no longer in this military will there be segregated units. He said segregation was ineffective, inefficient, inhuman, and it would not be in the military. 